background to this title. I have three sisters. My second sister, my youngest sister, is named Sharon. And without a doubt, Sharon is a person of faith. She was paralyzed at the age of 12. I mean, I was getting ready to go off to my second year of college. My parents were getting ready to take me to the airport. It was a Sunday morning, and I heard a scream. And I ran up the stairs to our home in Chicago, Illinois, to find my sister lying on the floor. She couldn't get up. She couldn't walk. Over the next several years, she had several doctors examine her. Several things tried to take place. She never, from that day forward, ever went to school until she got to college. Private tutors every day in her home. Couldn't walk. If she's ever down there, she's a beautiful girl, but she, uh, she has a very severe curvature of the spine. Her one leg is just atrophied terribly. But she's definitely a person of faith. She has told me many times, told me on the phone a week ago, I'm still waiting for God to heal me. I haven't given up on that. And she's how old now? 60? She'll be 60 in August. So from the time of 12 to the time of 60, some people would tell her she's just plain crazy. I think she has crazy faith. And the reason I tell you that, I'm going to tell you a story about her that uh, took place when I was the senior pastor, lead pastor in Long Island, New York, in Franklin Square at Buffalo Assembly of God. Sharon was not just a member of the church. She was also the most evangelical person I've ever met in the life and the most evangelistic person in the entire church. By that I mean Sharon could not meet anybody or speak to anyone in any situation. And I mean, here's a girl who basically you could look at her and know she has physical affliction. Her mind's sharp, went through college on scholarships, became a nurse, and then became a, one of the first two or 300 ultrasound people in the entire nation. In fact, one of the stories I like to tell about her, she worked for the most famous radiologist in New York City. I think his name was Dr. Swiner. He treated people like, well, when President Reagan was shot, guess who took care of him? Dr. Schweiner. Sharon told me, I did the ultrasound on President Reagan. I was flown to do the ultrasound on the Shah of Iran. I did the ultrasound on Jackie Kennedy. I said, Sharon, you need to quit telling people that. She said, why? I said, those people all died. Did your doctor treat anybody who lived? Anyways, you could not meet Sharon even today without, if you had a two-minute conversation with her, you'd know that she has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and she is a person of faith. Let me give you an example. I was pastor there in New York before I came here. The ladies occasionally would go to Roosevelt Field, and that was, uh, anybody know where Roosevelt Field is? At that time, it was the largest shopping mall in the eastern seaboard. It still may be one of the largest. Multiple stories, parking lots, multiple stories, her and a few of the ladies went up on the upper level when they parked, and they went in, and they were shopping, and they were there for a couple hours, and they came back out, and as leaving to get to her car, a man approached her, thinking that, well, here's a person that's disabled. I'll be able to get them and get away from them what they have. So walked up to her and grabbed her purse and took off running. Sharon immediately started speaking in tongues. It didn't stop there. She decided to interpret her own tongue. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, drop my purse. The other ladies are like backing up against the wall. Not Sharon. Anybody want to guess what happened next? The girl turned around, took one look at her, threw the purse back toward her, turned around and started running. After all, Sharon would tell you the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll do what? And she said, that guy was full of the devil. Now, Sharon didn't really want to tell me when they came home that day and when the ladies were talking about it, uh, they really didn't want to tell me what happened. Barbara wasn't with them. It was another group of ladies. But one of Bar Sharon's friends told me the following, told me the story, and then said to me, Pastor, you know what? Every other woman in that situation would have given up their purse and been thankful they were alive. But not Sharon. And she's shaking her head. And then Sharon's friend said this, Pastor, your sister is just plain crazy. 
Now, to be blunt, I don't think of my sister as crazy. Instead, I've known her all her life. A person who was 60 years old who was crippled at 12. I'm still waiting every day for God to heal me. In fact, she has put aside thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars so that on the day that she's healed, she can have the largest feast the church had ever had to celebrate her healing. Now, although I prefer to believe my sister's not crazy, that she just has crazy faith, I want to give a little disclaimer here. Whether you're crazy or whether you just have crazy faith, I would not recommend, I do not believe it's wise for any woman to risk harm in a mall parking lot when they're accosted by a thief to shout out, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, drop my purse. I'm not sure that's real good wisdom. Well, enough said about Sharon today. In this morning's message slash teaching, I'm going to speak to you about a person of faith who lived in the Old Testament. His name at first was Abram, it later became Abraham. And if you would take the time to just read the first part of his story, not the entire story, but the first part of his story, you may come to the conclusion that uh, this guy had, well, that he was crazy. I prefer to believe that he had crazy faith. Reading Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 from the Message Bible this morning, we find these words. God told Abram, leave your country, your family, your father's home for a land that I will show you. Now, over the course of the next few moments, I'm going to ask you to try to get a mind picture of the following scenario. Picture this if you can. When God spoke the words that I just read from Genesis 12:1, Abraham at that time in his life was not a believer. In fact, he was actually living a rather comfortable living in a community called Ur. It was actually a large city. It had a great marketplace, opportunities to make a lot of living. Unfortunately, Ur was also a community where no one, and I mean no one, knew, had heard about, or served Jehovah God. Oh, the people of Ur, they did have their own gods. They had two of them. They were man-made gods, if you were, and one was called Namer, or the moon god, and the other was Namer's wife, the moon god's wife, and her name was Ningal. Now, possibly you didn't know this, but most theologians believe that Abraham, the way he made his living prior to chapter 12, verse 1, he made his living, a very good living, by making and then selling little graven images or idols of Namer and Nigel. In my opinion, this is why the one true God, and how many believe that God's not willing that any should perish? That's why I believe the one true God called out to Abraham, and I'm going to read verse 1 again, this time from the Hartman's Paraphrase Version, saying, Abraham, it's time to quit your job. Leave your country, leave your friends, leave your home, and head toward a place that you've never heard of. Now, it's important to keep in mind that up until this moment in time, the only God, little g, that Abram had ever heard of were graven images. Idols that he made and sold and made a very comfortable living. But now for the first time in his life, now he's hearing from the one true, all these other gods, he probably, this is no problem. I'll talk to people, hey, you want Nigo in your life. You want neighbor in your life. They're going to help you. I'm going to help myself. But now he's hearing the one true God speaking to him. This is a God that he never had heard from, never even imagined existed. So here's the question for you, and I hope you have a mind picture. Continue your mind picture with this. If you were Abraham and God spoke to you, how would you respond especially if it was the first time in your life you ever heard from him. Would you respond in faith believing? Or would you possibly think that maybe, just maybe, you were a little bit crazy? By the way, if you live in the year 2017 and you start telling people, non-believers, God's speaking to me. 
How many believe they're going to think you're acting in faith believing? How many believe they think they're going to think you're a little bit crazy? Well, I trust you're keeping up with the mind picture. For in my mind picture, when Abram heard Jehovah God calling out to him, I believe he responded with faith. Or should I say he responded with crazy faith? Because everybody else was going to think he was crazy if he told them, guess what? I was there making idols, and it wasn't these idols that spoke to me. I heard a voice speaking to me, telling me, I'm the one true God, and I've got a plan for your life. And they go, yeah, okay. I believe he responded in crazy faith. And I also believe in the year 2017 that God is still calling out to people today. Possibly he called out to you when you were a younger person. Possibly he called out to you this week. Telling you, speaking to you. Telling you what to do. Telling you where to go. Telling you what to say. And when this happens, you either have to respond in faith, crazy faith if you will, because other people are going to think you're nuts. Or you're going to have to positive, possibly believe that you're responding in faith, crazy faith. As I mentioned, in the year 2017, God is still calling out to people, speaking to them, telling them what to do, telling them where to go, telling them what to say. And if you believe that that's possible, if that's happened to you, say amen. Now let me see if I can make the mind picture a little more personal to you by asking the following question. Don't raise your hand. When was the last time God spoke to you? I mean, you know that he spoke to you. If you'd like, I'll bring you to my office one day, and I have several Bibles, and there's a couple Bibles I'd never let leave the office. I've been a credentialed minister in the Assemblies of God since I've been 19 years old. It's a long time. In my office, I have a Bible where I know, not guess, not hope, but know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God spoke to me telling me where to go, what to do, what to say. I call those times burning bush experiences. By burning bush experience, I mean, you know, everybody knows the story of Moses and the burning bush. If that story wasn't in the Bible, how many would believe that actually took place, that God spoke to somebody out of a bush? I've got five times in my life where I know, not guess, not suggest, but know that God, and I wrote those times down in my Bible. So in those moments when I think God doesn't speak to me, I can go back and say, well, on this date, he spoke to me. On this date, he spoke to me. On this date, he spoke to me. So I would ask you, when's the last time God spoke to you? Told you what to do, where to go, what to say? If you or I would tell any non-believer that God has spoken to us in that way, they would think we're just plain crazy. But for those of us who have heard the voice of God, and as I said to you five times since I've been 19, I'm a little older than that now. It's amazing how people will tell, I mean, I've had people tell me, I had one guy tell me God tells him where to turn his car, turn left, turn right, do this, do that. Maybe, I'm not going to say he's nuts, but I think he's nuts. God doesn't speak to people that often. And you know why he doesn't speak to people that often? Because they refuse to listen. They refuse to act upon what he says. They think, I'm crazy, I'm just hearing things. But not Abram. In Abram's case, it meant more than just believing that God spoke to him. Meant crazy faith meant that he would be obedient and do exactly what God told him to do, exactly what God told him where to go, exactly to say what God told him to say. Hmm. I found it kind of difficult to be obedient to God when he tells me what to do, where to go, what to say. You know why? Because I don't want people to think I'm nuts. Could you imagine going to a bank and telling a bank, here's the keys to your church? Either extend us an additional loan or come get your church, but God told me to do that to it. And the bank said, we can't do that. I said, okay, come get your church. Church was over a million dollars in debt, didn't have very many people, couldn't make the mortgage payments. I said, come get your church. The next day he called me up and said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. Not only are we going to not come get your church, we're going to loan you the money, your church the money necessary to finish the building 
and we're going to lower your interest rate a couple points, and we're not going to charge you interest or principal for at least a year. If I had said when God said, go do that, I'd said, wait a second. That's crazy. Nobody's going to do that. See, being obedient to what God says to do and say of where to go, it's not easy. Is it any wonder the Bible is easy to read, but it's hard to live? But easy or not, if God has given you a crazy calling, then you're going to need more than faith. You're going to need crazy faith in order for you to do that which he's called you to do. I had an associate pastor in a previous church who said to me, Pastor, I just can't be in the ministry full-time. I mean, he was already probably 45 years old. And I said, why aren't you in the ministry full-time? He said, well, Pastor, my, my goal is to earn enough money so that when I have enough money in the bank, then I'll go start a church somewhere. and you know, I, I won't need the church to support me. I'll... And guess what? He's 10 years older than me, and he's never pastored a church, but yet he'd tell you, God's called me to pastor. Why is he now pastoring? Just a question. Maybe because he thinks he's crazy when he hears from God. He he can tell you, God called me to pastor, but he's not doing it. Maybe he needs crazy faith. And if God has given you a crazy calling, something that nobody would believe, you need to have crazy faith to continue in that. Moving forward in today's message entitled, Crazy Faith or Just Plain Crazy. After Abraham received his crazy calling, God now gives him a clear commission. Reading verses 1 through 3, start with 1 again and read verses 2 and 3 from the Message Bible this time. God told Abram, leave your country, leave your family, leave your father's home for a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and bless you. I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I will curse. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Do you understand what's happening in this passage? Do you understand that when God told Abram to give up everything he knew, to give up that which enabled him to make a very comfortable living, to give up his job, to give up his mom and dad and move away, to leave his home, probably a nice home, and head out toward a place in the middle of a desert somewhere, a place that he's never heard of, a place he's never seen. And yet he did it. Why? Because he believed that this God, this God that he heard from for the first time in his life, had a plan for his life. A divine commission, if you will. And you know what? In the year 2017, God still has plans and divine commissions for people's lives. How do I know he has a plan for your life, a divine commission for your life? Simple. He had one for mine. Barbara could tell you the year was 1978. I owned a business. I owned a business with a warehouse, and we don't tell this story a lot, with a warehouse that was larger than this sanctuary. I drove a pickup truck. My wife drove a brand new car. We owned a duplex at another home as well. And God said, I want you to go pastor a church. That church had 13 people. Do you really think it was easy for me to give that up? We were at a time in our life where if I wanted to go away somewhere, all I had to do was say, Barbara, pack the suitcase. We're going to Disney World for the weekend, or we're going to SeaWorld, or we're going here, we're going there. To leave a very good living to a place, that a two-bedroom house, with four kids sleeping in two bunk beds, making $250 a week if it came in, and sometimes it didn't come in. Wow. But I believe God has a plan for people's lives if they'll listen to what he has to say. In fact, in Jeremiah 29, 11, you'll find him saying this about his plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know what I'm doing. This is God speaking. I have it all planned out. Plan to take care of you, not abandon you. Plan to give you the future that you hope for. You see, God's the perfect father. As a parent, if my children come to me and say, Dad, what do I do for a living? Here's what I would tell them. I want you to do something that will make you happy. As long as it's not illegal, as long as it's not immoral, as long as it's not unethical, I want you to do what makes you happy. How many believe God's the perfect God? Wave at me. He's the perfect father. 
You really think he wants you to do something that's not going to make you happy? We went from making a very, very comfortable living to making $250 a week if it came in in 1979, and many times it didn't come in. And Barbara and I sat last night in the back then room of our home holding hands, reflected on that. You know, it was some of the happiest time. I don't want to go through it again. I'll be honest with you. I like getting a paycheck. But it was some of the happiest times in our life because God has a plan for our life. Abraham, when God called him and said, I want you to quit your job, leave your house, leave your family, leave everything behind, and go to a place that you don't even know where you're going, Abram could have easily chosen to say, I'm just hearing things. You know, not all other people think I'm crazy. I think I'm going crazy. He could have chosen to stay there and err and continue the rich lifestyle that he'd become accustomed to. But because he was crazy enough to believe not only that God spoke to him, but he was crazy enough to believe that God would keep his word and bless the entire world through him. Say what? That's nuts to believe that. That's crazy. To, or it's crazy faith. See, the world would tell you a bird in hand's worth two in the bush. Well, you know what? I, I could do this. I, I could be here. And I could just tell the people, you know, these little idols I'm making, they're just figurines you could put up and you, you could pay me twenty nine ninety five, blah, 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 whatever. No. And I know a bird in hand's worth two in the bush. And I know it doesn't seem rational to step out in faith. But I've discovered that crazy faith works. It's worked for Abraham. It worked for my sister Sharon. Again, I would tell her, ladies, please, if somebody steals your purse, don't go stop in the name of Jesus, drop my purse. But it worked for Abraham, it worked for Sharon, and it's worked for me. Reading Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and then continuing verses 4 through 9, here's where we find the following. Hope you have a mind picture in this message entitled, Crazy Faith or Just Plain Crazy. God told Abram, Leave your country, your family, and your father's home for a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation and bless you. I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I'll curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Hmm. So Abram left just as God said, and Lot left with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he left. Abram took his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot with him, along with all the possessions of people that had gotten in Haran, and set out for the land of Canaan and arrived safe and sound. Abram passed through the country as far as Shechem and the Oak of, Mo and the Oak of Omorah. At that time, the Canaanites also occupied the land. And God appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your children. Abram built an altar at that place the place God had appeared to him. He moved on from there to the hill country. I mean, think of that. I'm going to build an altar. Hey, this is it. I've arrived. And God said, move on. I had a wise minister when I got my first church. He said, Pastor, you'll probably be here about two years. I said, what's the story? He said, being in the ministry is much like a whistle-stop tour. Remember that, Barbara? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, usually, he said, you'll go to that first church and you'll make an abundance of mistakes. And you'll leave and you need to pray that God doesn't send somebody in there to add to your mistakes. He said, then you go to another church and hopefully you won't make the same mistakes again. But you'll make new ones. And God will have you there for a while. And then you move to another church and you'll move to another church. And by the time you're about 45, he'll put you in a place that you're probably going to stay till you retire. Hmm. How old were you when we came here, Barbara? 40, I, was a little, I was a late bloomer, 46. Every time he went, he built an altar at the place that God appeared to him or spoke to him. And he moved on from there to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent between Bethel and the west and Ai to the east. That's what it says then. And he built an altar there and prayed to God. You have the mind picture? I got four minutes after 12 and I could continue for another hour and a half on Abraham. I just suggest you read his life story. The first few pages of his story, you go, this guy's nuts. But if you read his entire story, you'll find out that he wasn't just plain crazy. He had crazy faith. 
Little darling, it's time. As Barbara heads to the piano and Jonathan comes to lead us in a closing song, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest of what has happened so far in Abraham's life. After Abraham received his crazy calling, God gave him a clear commission. Maybe it was a crazy commission, if you will. And Abraham responded with complete commitment or crazy faith, if you will. It took crazy faith for Abraham to respond with a complete commitment. It wasn't like, I'll go where you want me to go, O oh Lord, as long as it lines up with my plans. I'll do what you want me to do, O oh Lord, as long as it lines up with what I want to do. I'll say what you want me to say, O oh Lord, as long as it lines up with what I want to say. I want you to listen to me, folks. I'm going to say this in love. You could question my ability as a preacher. You could question my ability as a pastor. You could question my ability as a budget manager. Don't you dare question my calling or my anointing because my anointing and my calling comes from the Lord God Almighty. Anybody, anybody who questions that anointing needs to realize God said, I'll bless those who bless Ed Hartman and I'll curse those who curse Ed Hartman. You know, that's God's voice through the power of his word. That's not me. And it doesn't just apply to me. If you're speaking evil of somebody who's a believer, God will curse you every time, God. Believe me. You see, it took great faith for Abraham to respond with complete commitment. It takes great faith to do and say and act upon things that only you know God spoke to your heart. You see, the bottom line is this. Great faith has great rewards. If all we're willing to do is risk little, I, t I tell people, I mean, listen, you don't tithe? That's Old Testament. I know it's Old Testament. But if those Old Testament saints could tithe based on the fact that they died if they didn't, shouldn't I tithe on the grace that God has given me? In fact, I should give do more than tithe. See, when we risk little, the rewards are little. But if we're willing to risk much in every area of our life, the rewards are going to be much. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. On a regular basis, my mother would say to me, my father used to say to me, we feel so bad that we don't have anything to leave you. What I got from my dad was the funeral bill. What I'm going to get from my mom is the funeral bill, to be honest with you. That's it. And I'll be proud to, I was proud to pay for my dad's, and I'll be proud to pay for my mom's. But they said, we're sorry, we don't have anything to leave you. And I said, my mom, I told her just a couple weeks ago again, Mom, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than wealth untold. If it wasn't for you and Daddy, I may have earned a great living, and I've made good money, I'm, I'm thankful for that, but I'd be on my way to hell. But because you taught me to go where he told me to go, to do what he tells me to do, to say what he tells me to say. I'm wealthier than anybody I know. And when I take the last breath, absent from my body is going to be present with the Lord. Try to put a price tag on that. It wasn't easy for Abram, Abraham to journey to the promised land. It wasn't anything but easy. But guess what? Abraham somehow, someway knew that which today's opening scripture says is true. It reads like this in Hebrews 11 and 1. If you read a few verses after this, you'll find that it talks about Abraham too. Here's what it says. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. What Abraham saw when God spoke to him that first time, what Abraham saw, he saw by faith. If he told that to somebody else, they would have said, you're crazy. You're plain crazy. I don't think so. I choose to believe Abraham was like my sister Sharon. Like many of you. He simply had crazy faith. And I choose to believe it was crazy faith that enabled him to build a strong relationship with God. 
Even though he was far from perfect. You think Abraham was a great child of God? The guy was an habitual liar. I hate to say this, he tried to pimp out his own wife. Read the story. But because he had crazy faith, it enabled him to build a relationship with God that most, if not all, believers would say, boy, I wish I had faith like Abraham. Faith that would give me the ability to trust God to do what He tells me to do, to go where He tells me to go, to say what He tells me to say, and keep my mouth shut when the Word tells me to do so. Friends, it was crazy faith that enabled him to have a desire to build an altar. Here's a guy that made, a few years earlier, was making idols for a living. He knew something about building something. <laughs> Gave him the desire not to build an altar to those two little gods, but build an altar for God. And to thank God in advance for things, and listen to this now, thank God in advance for things that Abraham himself would never see come to pass. Read the chapter of Hebrew 11. These people had faith. They never saw what God promised them come to pass, but they just, they believed God would do it. Final closing. Somehow, some way, even though some people would say Abraham was just plain crazy, I would say, and I hope that you would say, that Abraham received God's calling. They received God's commission. And because he received it with crazy faith, if you will, he made a crazy commitment to fulfill that which God called him to do. And if God's called you, if he's spoken to you, I would tell you, you can have faith, but you need to have crazy faith. That crazy faith is the confidence that that which you hope for will actually happen. And it will give you the assurance that you will see. Maybe you won't see it in your lifetime. Abraham did. I'm going to bless the world through you, Abraham. He didn't get to see that. But he had the assurance that that would take place. Why? Because he had crazy faith enough faith to believe that what God said would take place would take place. Would you bow your heart with me in prayer? Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for your love. Lord Jesus, you know this is a fact and I could show anyone who ever wants to look at the top of every one of my sermons it says, Pastor, by the grace of God, preach from the Word of God. Am I the best preacher? Probably not. Do I use others' material, people's material? On a regular basis. I don't apologize for that. In fact, Lord, I use your Word every week. I guess that's, everybody else, that's somebody else's material. It's your material. In the year 2017, I believe, God, you're still calling to people, speaking to them, telling them what to do, telling them where to go, telling them what to say. And I believe if they listen, if they hear your voice and they act upon that, you will fulfill your plan in their life. You will not abandon them. You have a plan for their future, a good plan, a perfect plan. Jesus be Jesus in all your beauty, all your splendor, all your power, and we give you praise. And everyone who agrees with that, say amen. I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, to stand to your feet. Jonathan's going to come back and he's going to lead us in the, I don't think it's the whole song, but lead us in part of the song that we sang during offering oceans. Is that what we're doing today? Why don't you stand to your feet? Let's sing that together.